Big Brains is supported by U Chicago's Leadership and Society Initiative, which guides accomplished executives in transitioning from longstanding careers toward purposeful next chapters of leadership for society. Your next chapter matters. More at leadershipforsociety.uchicago.edu. It's rare for a book about academic research to become a household name, but that's more than the case for Freakonomics. It's the kind of book that nearly everyone in your family may have heard of. Here at the University of Chicago, we're lucky to be home of one of its authors, Professor Stephen Levitt. On this episode, we got to sit down with Levitt in front of a live studio audience to talk about the legacy of Freakonomics and what it means to think like a freak, what the science says about how to make that decision you've been dreading, why Levitt's work piqued the interest of the CIA in the early 2000s, and why he thinks his most recent research is the holy grail of crime prevention and a possible solution to our mass incarceration problem. Welcome to Big Brains, where we translate the biggest ideas and complex discoveries into digestible brain food. Big Brains, Little Bites from the University of Chicago Podcast Network. I'm your host, Paul Rand. On today's episode, the past and future of Freakonomics research. You know, it's interesting, for a guy who is really one of the world's most noted economists, you don't necessarily think about yourself as an economist, do you? I think I'm an economist by training, yep. but I identify more as a data scientist. Okay. I, I mean, the thing I love to do is get a pile of data and make sense of it. And I'm, I'm actually really out of step with my own profession. I don't value the same things, and I think they don't like me that much, and I don't like them but, that but, much. What so. do you mean by that? Talk about that for a second. <laughs> so, so economics is a field in which entry is largely determined by how good you are at math. To get okay. into a PhD program these days, you have to be incredibly good at math. I've what was never, your class 1A you took at Harvard? Math 1A. So yeah. I took exactly one, one math class in my college career. It's called <laughs> Math 1A. It was high school math over again because I hadn't learned calculus when I took it in high school. I, I showed up at the class, and it was all men, and they were all like six foot three inch tall and weighed like 215 pounds. And it was because it was me and the hockey team and the football team were the only people <laughs> who were bad enough at math at Harvard that they were put in this, this class. So I, got, I was the best in the class, number one in the class, but I was smart enough to know that I couldn't compete with other people <laughs> in math. So I didn't take math. I, I only went to get a PhD in economics because I had gone into management consulting and I hated it and I needed something else to do. And, and I thought, well, the only thing I was really good at was economics, so I'd go get an economics PhD. And it was, a, it was a terrible match for me because I, 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 I wasn't interested in technicality. I wasn't interested in math. I really was interested in data, but there was no such thing as a data scientist. I'm old. It was, it was many years ago, 30 years ago, there, there really wasn't such a job as being a data scientist. So Austin Goolsby, who many of you might know, Austin was in my class, and, and he was an anointed one. So Austin had all of the right skills and preparation. And he and the other anointed one sat down one day to make a list of who the failures were going to be. And so there were four of us on the list. And, and Austin told me I was right on that list of the four. And that actually did give me a kind of freedom to be myself. You weren't devastated by that. Well, they didn't tell me until later. Okay, it only came it. out a few years later. But no, I would have I would have said the same thing. It was obvious. It was not it was not unclear to anyone that I was a black sheep in this group. Okay. But it, it gave me the freedom to be myself. And I think that's something that young people in academics rarely feel empowered to do. Yes. I was really lucky, and I had a, a niche within economics, thinking of offbeat problems and finding ways to answer those questions using data that other people hadn't usually used before. In a weird way, it was very marginal, and yet I was able to get my papers published in, in good journals and, and perhaps inspired people to think that you could use, like Gary Becker, and right, right, in, the, right. in, the, in the like in Gary Becker's huge footsteps, my little tiny footsteps followed them of inspiring people to think you could apply economics to all sorts of settings. So after we wrote Free Economics, I'd always loved being an academic, but I realized it was more fun. Free Economics was more fun. The the opportunities, a whole new opportunity set opened up to me, now, and well, I just found there were more. Let's fun. talk about this. Yeah. When when you think about what's economics and what's Free Economics, because you really have become synonymous with that mm -hmm. brand. 
How did you come up with it, and how do you think about it then and today? So I had been in the profession for 10 years, okay. and I had published probably 40 papers, and they were just all the things that interested me, and they were the things that, many of them were the things that showed up in the book, like real estate agents were ripping off their clients, and sumo wrestlers were cheating, and Chicago public school teachers were erasing the answers to make themselves look better, and, and a bunch of stuff on abortion and crime, and all this stuff. So I, I had just done this without any spirit other than excitement. I just, I loved getting my hands into data and answers questions, but it didn't really have much of a point. So then... Everything changed when, so I won, I won this prize. What's the name of the prize again? John Bates Clark Medal. Okay. The New York Times wanted to write a piece about me. I more or less said no, okay. but they were persistent. I really did it for my mom, because my mom loved reading about me in the newspaper, and so I thought, okay, I'll, just, I'll take one for the team, I'll do this so my mom can read about me in the newspaper. Now, interestingly, Stephen Dubner, yep. who was asked to write it, he said no repeatedly, too. He didn't want to do it. But then he said, I'm going to be in Chicago, and could we spend the morning of Thursday? And I said, sure. And so we spent the morning, and it was great. And I was like, okay, see you later. He said, well, actually, I don't have that much else to do. Would you mind if I went to lunch with you? And there's a terrible problem when you're being interviewed for the New York Times. Right? You, you're in a very subservient position because you have to be as nice as possible to the <laughs> <Okay>. reporter. <laughs> you don't want to write something terrible. So I'm like, okay, I guess you could come to lunch with me. So then when lunch was over, I said, well, I'll see you later. I hope the article's really good. He said, well, I actually don't have any plans. Could I just come and sit with you in your office? And I said, well, you could, but what I'm going to do for the rest of the afternoon is I'm going to sit at my computer, and I'm going to type in the data, and you know, play with the data, and I'm not going to say a word to anyone, so I don't think it'll be very entertaining. He said, oh, no, no problem. I'll just come, come, won't say anything. But he, of course he was. So he, he continued to ask me questions, and, and he was really amazed, I have to say. He had read every paper I'd ever written, seemed to understand every paper I'd ever written, and as soon as I stopped answering one question, he would ask me another one. He was never at a loss for a question, and it didn't end then. He... He said, well, I don't have any plans tomorrow. How about we meet again? <laughs> so he spent the entire day, the next day, by 3 p.m. on the Friday. So he had now been there for however many hours. I said, hey, I'm getting kind of tired. Should we just go to the racetrack and have some beers? And so we ended up getting drunk and betting on the horse races. And that's when I made this mistake. I, I started getting a little more relaxed and loose-lipped. And he asked me what I thought of the CIA. And I blurted out that if I were in charge of catching terrorists, I'd be better than the CIA. Okay? And as soon as I said that, I'm like, why did I say that? That was really <laughs> stupid. But I thought, he had taped me for all these hours. What are the chances that that one little blur, you know, blurted line would get in there? And it ends up being the last sentence of the article is me throwing down the gauntlet to the CIA. Anyway, it was interesting. Two days later, the CIA called me on the phone to, to talk with him. So it was actually turned out. What do they want to talk to you about? Uh, they were trying to catch terrorists, and okay. they, were, um, they were working on a, a program around, uh, none of this classified, I, I think I can freely talk about it. They were hoping they could catch terrorists by using financial markets as an early warning signal. So if someone was going to blow up a bunch of McDonald's, then they would short McDonald's stock a week ahead of time, and that would put out a red flag. And so they invited me and a oh, bunch gosh, of other people, okay. Donna Cia, to, to, to see if that would work. The most interesting thing that happened is that as all of the experts were talking about how we would trade on a terrorist attack if we were the financiers in a way we wouldn't get caught, one of the people who was the experts said, you guys are all a bunch of idiots. And we kind of bristled, like, wait, 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 what do you mean we're idiots? We're the ones who are telling the CIA hey, their thing's not going to work. He was sitting in his office when he saw a, a plane crash into mm. the World Trade Center. And he said, I jumped on the phone and I called my traders and I said, trade everything you can, as fast as you can, as fast as you can. By knowing an attack had happened, it took something like seven or nine minutes before the market shut down, they made enormous, inordinate amounts of money, you know, 20, 50 million dollars in those seven minutes wow. trading. And he said, you're all a bunch of idiots because why in the world would you trade in advance of a terrorist attack? If you know a terrorist attack is going to happen, First of all, it might not go off, and so why would you want to trade and lose my hand? But secondly, if you have people on the ground telling you what happened, you have 10 minutes. You can do all the trading you want. You can make as much money as you want, as uh. much as off your capital. And then how is anyone going to say you're a terrorist financier? It's not your fault that you happened to see the attack happen. It's, that was just don't luck. And it was really interesting. It was one that of those moments where, where I thought about this problem a lot, 
And then somebody smarter than me, or at least with different experiences, immediately saw the, the right answer. Well, p part of this idea, I guess, getting into what, what is this concept of when you put the freak in front of it, and then you think about, well, how does the person with this mindset look at some of these problems differently than somebody else who might go? And, and it really is this idea of decisions and incentives, I guess. Is that kind of how you think about it? Yeah, I, I would say the ideas that motivate Freakonomics are exactly the ideas that are central to microeconomics. It's about incentives. It's Can you, a, by the way, explain yeah. for, for folks the difference between macro sure. and micro? Sure. So microeconomics is the study of individual decision-making. So when faced with trade-offs or constraints, how do people make the best choices? Okay. And that would be people or, or businesses. Part of this idea is... The, how people are making decisions and thinking about it. There are things that you've done, like coin toss studies and so forth, right? Yeah, so let's take that. I just described economics as a discipline that's uh, about decision-making. What do you yep. do when there are trade-offs? And yet, if somebody comes to me and says, should I do this or should I do that, I have absolutely no idea what to tell them because there's, uh, without knowing their utility function and all of their opportunity set, I don't have anything to say. And that seems like a real failure of a discipline that thinks it should be trying to help people make better decisions. So Stephen Dubner has this free economics podcast. He, he does whatever he wants on that podcast. So okay. it's, it's very different than our books. So all of our books were anchored in academic studies. But after you do a podcast for 10 years, you got to start right, doing it. Right. So, so Dubner just on his own volition decided that people didn't quit enough. And so I would say with zero evidence did a podcast in which he just asserted and interviewed a bunch of people and made the point and concluded that people didn't quit enough. And we started getting emails, dozens and dozens of people saying, I listened to your podcast and I quit my job. I even, one of my, <laughs> one of my, consult one of my consulting friends in venture capital, who I had immense respect for, wrote me and said, I just listened to your podcast and I, I quit my job and I'm starting my own venture capital firm. And that was so shocking to me that it actually opened up a whole new way of thinking. Because I realized, wait a second, Dubner's podcast, our podcast, mostly his podcast, is so powerful, he can get people to do whatever he wants. And I thought, that is amazing. So now I have a whole new tool, which is I can take this media franchise, and the question I'm interested in is, is really, is it true? Do people quit too much or too little? And Dubner believed that they quit too little. But how could you test it? It's not even obvious how you test that question if you have a randomized experiment, right? So if I took half of the audience, this is half of the audience. Let's say the question is, should you get divorced, okay? So I take all the married people on the left side of this room. You all go get divorced, okay? I take all the people on the right side. Even if you want to get divorced, you're not allowed to get divorced. Okay. We roll things out 10 years. We see how things go. That wouldn't even answer the question, right? Because I don't want to know whether getting divorced is good on average for people. I want to know for people who just can't decide, right? They're right on the margin. They don't, for those people... Those are the people who are trying, who we want to know, should you get divorced or not? Because it would be really in helpful to know if it's the right thing to do. And so what we ended up doing, and everybody told me it was a terrible idea. This is, of, of all the things I've done in academics, this is the one that I was most told was a terrible idea, is we spent months and months building a website. Uh, and all it really did, after a lot of smoke and mirrors, because we didn't want the people who were in the study, they knew they were in a study, but we didn't want them to know why they were in a study, was that at the end we said, well, if you, do you have a problem you can't decide on? Okay, and we gave them lots to choose from, but serious problems like quitting your job, ending your relationships, and whatnot. After we asked them a bunch of questions to make them feel like we were helping them try to make, decide, what we really want them to say is, I still don't know what to do. And then we would literally toss a coin for them on the website. Uh -huh. And if it came up heads, who would tell them to <laughs> get divorced? If it came up tails, we say, don't get divorced. And we did this. And first of all, you say, well, no. You actually told people to get divorced. Absolutely. Okay. But I mean, we also told them not to get divorced, and that could be just as bad as telling them <laughs> to get divorced. You know. <laughs> Amazingly, something like twenty-five thousand people flipped coins oh my on gosh. the website. About two-thirds, sixty to sixty percent to two-thirds, actually followed the coin toss. Right. So the people who got heads were more likely to get divorced than the people who didn't, who got tails, and the people who got heads were more likely to quit the jobs than the ones who didn't. And partly, it's, it was, it, there's a lot of complicated issues about reporting and whatnot, but, but the, the, really the best thing we did in that study was to ask people to also give us a trusted third party who would help them make their decision, or help support them in their decision. But what that meant was six months later, I could email the friend 
and say, hey, did your friend get divorced or not? Because I don't really necessarily believe the person who, who knows that I told them to divorce could easily lie to me and say it. But I doubt their friends would lie about it. It turned out that across every decision, essentially, the people who got heads were happier six months later than the people who got tails. Okay? And the people who got heads also changed their behavior more. They either got divorced more or they quit their jobs more than the people who got tails. So you would have expected, on average, the people who got heads and tails to be exactly as happy six months later because they were, in principle, exactly as happy at the time they did the coin toss because it was randomized. And so the only real conclusion, after you do some hard work on trying to make sure there aren't biases in there, in who's, re who's responding and, and are they lying to me and whatnot, but I, I'm at least convinced that I think we did, okay. we were able to work with that, is that these people who thought they were on the margin, who weren't sure what to do, who were really indifferent between a change and not a change, so indifferent that when this silly website flips and comes heads they actually do the decision more or less than, than otherwise, those people, when they made a change, were much happier. The, the, the people, they wanted to make a change but needed a nudge. Well, I, I think that every bias that is around us pushes us against change. So oftentimes okay. you pay the costs right away and you get the benefits in the long run. You're been, you've been brutally trained from an early age that winners never quit. Quitters never, yeah. winners never quit, quitters never win, that perseverance is a good thing. And so I think we just are all hmm. off. And so the beauty of this study for me is that now, anytime anyone asks me for advice about a decision, my rule is really easy. I try to figure out whether they're really on the margin, whether they're really not, you know, can't decide. And I try to figure out which path represents the biggest break from what they're doing right now. And I just say, you should, you should make the change. For me, it's one of the simple rules of thumb that guides my own life. And I think it should guide everyone's life, which is that if you think you're indifferent, then, you need to, then you're long overdue to have made a change. If you're enjoying the discussions that we're having on this program, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show that you should check out. It's called The Pie. Economists are always talking about the pie, how it grows and shrinks, how it's sliced, and who gets the biggest share. Join veteran NPR host Tess Vigland as she talks with leading economists about their cutting-edge research and key events of the day. Hear how the economic pie is at the heart of issues like the aftermath of a global pandemic, jobs, energy policy, and much more. How can we improve communications at work? Are stock markets really efficient? Should we let algorithms make moral choices? How will climate migration affect our societies? The Chicago Booth Review podcast addresses the big questions in business, policy, and markets with insights from the world's leading academic researchers. We bring you groundbreaking research in a clear and straightforward way. It could help you make better decisions, work smarter, and maybe even become happier. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. You have done your work in tons of different fields. One of the ones you're really known for is your work in crime. Mm -hmm. and, and my understanding is you got into crime research because you like cop shows. Is that some accuracy to that? Yes, yeah, so it was at this moment of truth for me in grad school when I realized I wasn't probably going to be very good at economics. And that did give me the luxury to try to study whatever I wanted. But I didn't know what I liked. Okay. Uh, and, and I realized, well, I watched the, the TV show Cops every day on TV, that's what I'm interested in. That's what excites me. And, and so I got, even though there's very little economic research done on crime, in part because it's not a market, but the kind of data methods that economists use turned out to be really helpful in that. And so really I thought of myself as a crime economist for, for the 10 or 15 years as okay. I was studying that. As you think through that period, what were some of the bigger insights in crime that, that really intrigued you? The two questions that I was really interested in was number one, why did crime go up so much in the 1960s? Okay. And then why did crime go down so much in the 1990s? I tried hard on why it went up in the 1960s, never figured that one out, never made any headway on that. But what I tried to do about the 1990s was just tick off every possible explanation, increases in police, increases in, 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 in uh, prisons, demographic changes, and none of those really worked. Okay. And, and then 
that's where my, my most famous study eventually came from, where I stumbled onto basic data on legalized abortion. And around, around in the 70s, in the, in one moment, the 80s, the peak in the 80s, it was something like one in four, one in three, one in four pregnancies in America ended in, in abortion. And that was really stunning to me. And I had actually looked at whether that might be related to crime, couldn't find a relationship, and it put it down. And, and actually, it was a, a chance encounter with another economist, John Donahue. We were working on a different paper, and I, I still remember the exact setting, sitting in the office, where he said, I had the craziest idea ever. I really think that maybe legalized abortion in the 1970s, why crime went down in the 1990s. And I said, yeah, I had that same idea, and I had a whole folder stuff, stuff I'd looked at. Uh. And it turned out I had looked too early, but John actually understood the theory better than me, and, and he had done a lot of research into what's, what we call unwantedness, that it, it turns out that unwanted children are at enormous risk for all sorts of bad life outcomes, whether it's suicide or, or um, crime or early childbearing themselves, things like that. And John had already assembled evidence that showed that after legalized abortion, there was a, a huge decline in the number of unwanted children. So, for instance, domestic adoption plummeted mm. after the legalized abortion. And then we looked at the data, and it was really became just clear in the raw data now that more time had passed that, that this was a really important potential phenomenon. It's a super simple story. Right? Unwanted children at risk for crime, legalized abortion reduced the number of kids who were unwanted, and so, therefore, legalized abortion should have reduced crime. And it was just an empirical question. Did, was it a big effect or a small effect? And you could calibrate it based on some of the earlier studies on unwantedness that had been done in, in Europe many years earlier, not about crime, but just about other life outcomes. And it really seemed like it could be big. And then when you looked at the data, it, it really was So we're going big. through another transition in that world. What do you think about when you see how difficult it is becoming to carry through on abortions today? So I think two things, maybe three things. One is, if it does indeed turn out to be true and persistent effect that it is, it's hard for some women to get abortions in this country, then I would strongly predict that those cohorts will be high in crime. Huh. Okay. But far more important is that people shouldn't get confused about my research having policy implications. Of all the reasons you would say that we should or shouldn't have legalized abortion in the United States, the effect on crime is just so far down the list. It is so unimportant relative to either the arguments about a woman's right to choose or, on the flip side, the view that abortion itself is some kind of murder, some form of murder. Uh, look, I don't know the answer. I, this is not my job to decide which of those is true. But... Those two perspectives so eclipse the very minor relative impact on crime that it's it would be a it would be misguided okay to to use my research to support either of those positions. It's just unimportant. So my, my research I think is very important for thinking about why crime has gone up and down and whether say other policies like mass incarceration should get the credit for it. Let's talk about this because you have a new project and it's called Radical Innovation for Social Change. Even that title says you're thinking there can be social change out of some of your insights. Or how do you think about what you're doing there and what you're hoping is going to happen? So what I'm trying to do is combine three worldviews into one. Worldviews? So, world views, okay. right? so one is an academic worldview of rigor, of ideas, of, of trying to do things right. The second is uh, an NGO or a nonprofit view of the world, which is that I'd like to actually have some impact and do some good. And I would say, realistically, my own academic work has had very little real world impact. It's gotten a lot of attention, but it hasn't changed policies. I don't think it's changed okay. a lot of lives. And the third worldview is this startup idea where you do things quickly and you're innovative and you do it on a shoestring. So we're trying to put those three together. We've been at it now about five years and we've tackled a bunch of problems. And I'll give you some examples. If Please you're do. So let's go back. Let's stick with crime. I'm talking about crime. So crime imposes an enormous cost on society. Yep. But efforts to control crime, like incarceration and whatnot, they also come with enormous costs. The, the holy grail of crime is how do you just convince people 
not to do the crime in the first okay. place. Okay, what's what we call deterrence. It turns out, both empirically and it makes common sense, that almost nobody will do a crime that they know they'll be caught for. For instance, people do not rob the Dunkin' Donuts when the police are in the Dunkin' Donuts. Right? It's just <laughs> empirically, you'd see that probably doesn't happen. Okay? So imagine that you actually could just take people who are known criminals and you just assign someone and they, they, a police officer followed them around all day long. They wouldn't do much crime. Okay? The thing is, with technology, we more or less have that ability in the form of GPS. Mm -hmm. There are a set of people in this country right now who are wearing ankle bracelets. Now, interestingly, these are people, say, who are out either on pretrial release or they're on parole, and they're wearing these ankle bracelets. The crazy thing that most people don't realize is that they're not mostly equipped with GPS. Huh. They actually use this old technology called RFID technology. There's a beacon in their house. So they're essentially under house arrest. If they go more than 60 feet from the beacon, it sends a signal that says they're more than 60 feet from the beacon. But then the sheriff can't find them because they don't have GPS on them. It makes no sense. Okay? So then we just actually started a pilot with the Cook County Sheriff, Tom Dart. We switched the bracelets over to GPS. And what you can do is you not only now can follow people around and know where they are, but we have the ability to link those up to the police databases. So in Chicago, for uh. instance, there's something called ShotSpotter. Every yes. time a shot is a gunshot occurs in Chicago, it's triangulated using echolocation, and they know exactly where that shot went. Now, we could, in real time, cross-reference where shots are taking place to whether or not there's someone who's on pretrial release who is wearing an ankle bracelet that's GPS-equipped and know whether they were there. Now, being there doesn't mean they were the person shooting. They might have been shot at, but it certainly seems of great interest to all involved to, number one, know that they were at the scene of that shooting, and number two, to know how to find them very quickly to go ask them what had happened actually at the scene mm. of that shooting. So the most important part is you tell them, look, you are wearing GPS. Don't do anything stupid. We will know if you do something stupid. That by and large, they do very little in the way of crime while they're doing that. Okay? And what's interesting is I say that now, many people who are left-leaning are, are feeling disgusted and revolted by, oh, big brother, da 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 okay? But what this really is it is the source of freedom for a large group of people who would otherwise be locked up. So, so we've had 15,000 people through our program. Everyone has been given the choice. Would they rather be locked up in jail or would they rather be on these bracelets? And 15,000 out of 15,000 said, yes, please let me be out of jail on this place. So, so if I put GPS on people, then they won't commit crime. That means I can let out enormous amounts mm. of people from prison because more or less the reason we have people in prison it's because we're afraid they're going to do crime if we release them. And you can go back and now you, you, you can completely rethink the whole criminal justice system. The first time somebody does a crime, you would never lock them up and disrupt their life, take them out of school, make them lose their job, send them downstate, away from the community. You would, you would give them some chances where now, oh, you made a mistake? Well, now we're going to monitor you. And as long as you don't make another mistake, you, you, you can just basically live your life the way you do it. So really, to me, this could be the thing which, which allows us to, from my rough estimates, I think we could, if we wanted to reduce crime by 50% by using this, reduce the prison population by 40%, or some, some combination of those two things. It would be the biggest policy impact. What's interesting is we've, we're doing it in Cook County. It's working. Mm. But we can't really convince anybody that's a good idea. So nobody likes it. Okay? The left hates it because it feels like big brother, my God. And, and, and look, I'll say, I've worn these ankle bracelets. Just to, they, they are like shackles. They are yep. the most uh, horrendous, dehumanizing thing in the world. But they shouldn't be shackles. They should be like Apple Watches. Right? There's no reason you couldn't do this with something that was just like everybody wears light, friendly, uh, imbue it with all sorts of other things that, that are useful. And then the right doesn't like it because it's, it's dismantling. Too easy. It's too easy. It's dismantling the prison industrial complex. Yep, yep. And so it's, it's funny that we just, it's an idea that to me feels like a winner. And we haven't, we haven't figured out the marketing to get anybody else to like it. All right, we have got, goodness, about 10 minutes left, and I bet you there's a lot of folks. Would you mind if you took some sure, questions great. from the room and Please. is Matt around with the 
microphone. Folks, as you listen to this conversation, or maybe you walked into the room saying, I always wanted to ask him about this, please take, take your shot. Yeah, Steve, so you mentioned that you think of yourself more as a data scientist than an economist. And I happen to be a data scientist. And a lot of what we do is not the kind of like looking at and playing with data that you're talking about. It's a lot of like, here's a data set, model it, and maybe you don't actually know what's going on. So it seems like you're describing something that's like almost different than what a lot of data scientists are doing. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on ways to teach the kind of intuition for I guess almost like the interpretable causal type of stuff that you're looking for in data as an economist that might be helpful for data scientists to think about. I think you're right that the, the notion of what data science encompasses is really, really big. And what I do is a very particular part of that, which is I, I try to find data, a pile of data, and make sense of it. Or often I'm motivated by a question, and that question leads me to a pile of data, which I, I either try to generate data or make sense of it. Whereas what many data scientists do, so often data science involves prediction, so, so really nothing I do involves prediction. Um, and much of what corporate data science does is trying to predict what will customers do, what will competitors do. So let me just acknowledge that I think that's true, that, that data science takes all sorts of forms, but I think there's a, a common theme to it, which is a good data scientist is highly attuned to the quality and the structure of the data that they're using and making sure that it is the right data to apply to a problem. And then using different notions from statistics or different techniques to try to look at the correlations in the data. And then to say, look, correlation is often not what we want. We want causality. Causality is more difficult to ascertain than correlation. And what kind of techniques can we, in this setting, do well to do it? So, so the second question is, how do you teach data science? So I don't know if I have... Or let me say, I don't have any answers to how you would do it, but what I very strongly believe is that we should be doing it. I think it's an absolute travesty that you can graduate from high school in this country and not know anything about data, barely have been exposed to data. I think it's an absolute travesty that the math we're teaching children today is exactly the math that I was taught 40 years ago in high school. It's pretty much the math that was taught 75 years ago in high school. My father was in high school. So one of the things that we've done through my, my center at risk is we, we brought together a consortium of like-minded people and we've created this institute called the, the Data Science for Everyone, which is now out there trying to do the hard work on the ground to, to get data science curriculum into the schools. And I, it's something I'm very passionate about, very excited about, because I think we're just doing such an enormous disservice to young people in continuing to teach them to do proofs about triangles and the angles of triangles, which no person ever will use again when we could be showing them data sets. It's, it's just mind-boggling to me that that useful skill is, is not seen as a central part of what schools should be doing to kids. Good. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your talk. This is really fascinating and your work. Uh, I, regarding the GPS angle bracelet, I'm fascinated by this idea. So first of all, I wanted to find out if anything's been written or published about it. So we haven't, we haven't, we, we have not published anything. We've been working with Cook County now for two or three years. It, it wasn't done in the nature of a controlled study, for instance. It was, it was, just, it was an opportunistic chance for us to, to work with them. I mean, we've analyzed it. So I can look and I can see of the say if there's been 15,000 person years of, of data from Cook County where they're wearing these bracelets, we can look and see how often the, the, those folks have been rearrested or how often they've been at the site of, of shots going off. And the numbers are, are really low. Mm. I but wouldn't there, say- There's no articles? We it. haven't yet. Um, I felt like the, the first group that I need to convince are the criminal justice people. And I haven't felt like academic articles will be the way to convince them. We've really felt like being on the ground, showing them how it works in Cook County, showing them the software that we've developed in Cook County that actually makes the job much easier for the sheriff's office than it otherwise has been our primary vehicle for trying to make the change. But yeah, I mean, I would say it's early days. We're just getting off the ground now. All right, but what I wanted really to find out is if this were in widespread use, 
Had you thought about the idea that it would be pretty easy to set these people up in crimes? All somebody would have to do in a gang is to get one of them in a car with them and then go do a drive it by shooting and blame it on the guy who's wearing the GPS bracelet or walk into a convenience store, pull out a gun, and rob it. So all we're going to know is that they were in a car that was in the vicinity. But that would in no way be enough evidence for the sheriff to say that they shot the gun, for instance. In fact, I think it would be the exact opposite, which is that if this person said, yeah, I was in the car, I was in the car with this gang member, and this gang member shot the gun, and if you go find that gang member, you're going to find the, um, the gunpowder on their hand and whatnot. I think it's actually the way you want criminal justice to work, which is that these, this bracelet creates a witness to a crime, and also a witness who has a very strong incentive to tell you the truth, because if he doesn't tell you the truth, he's going to be the leading suspect. And so in many ways, I actually think that it, your story is, is, is good. It's more likely to help us solve crime than to be a miscarriage of justice, where this innocent person gets blamed for a crime that he or she didn't do because nobody believes him or her that it was actually another gang member who did it. Now, you, if, if criminal justice works at all, then when the person who's wearing a bracelet says, hey, the guy who actually shot the gun is this person, and, I, and this is where they picked me up, and you can go see on cameras that are all over Chicago that this person drove their car that way, I should think it would help us. That's the biggest problem we have in Chicago, particularly in criminal justice, is that there is a, a real lack of witnesses and people unwilling to come forward. But one of, the, one of the perverse things about these bracelets is that it gives the people wearing them extremely strong incentives to tell us who really did the crime because they are the focal point of the investigation until they can point you to the real person. Good answer. And so I think that's really a good thing. Other people, it's, it's tricky. You get into tricky moral and ethical issues around this, uh, for sure. But my own feelings were already so deeply embedded in tricky moral and ethical issues about how we treat the criminal justice right. system that these are really, uh, are not, to me, not deal breakers. Coming up on top of the hour, one final one. You're, you have three iterations of your book. The last one, as we talked about, was 2015. Are there any more planned, and what do we have to look forward for, from you? I don't think there will be any more books. Okay. So I cannot write a Freakonomics book alone. Um, Stephen Dubner is it, its just a shared enterprise, Got it. Okay. And, and he's an amazing writer, and I, I don't have either the, the writing talent or, or the... Um, it just wouldn't be fun to do it, a team if we weren't a team. But he found initially, and he's convinced me, that podcasting is just a much better yeah, okay. medium for us than, than book writing. I mean, I mean, books do have their own virtues. They, right. they, they, they're longer lasting. They stick around. But honestly, every book we wrote sold less than the one before it. So it's not like <laughs> it felt like we were, uh, could just write books forever and people keep reading them. But the Freakonomics podcast reaches, it's a great podcast. It reaches more people in a month than many of our books did ever. It's just, it turns out that when you give stuff people for free, it, it helps. You give them people for free. Um, and you, he really delivers a great, a great product. Does. Then you have a way to reach people. So, so right now, to me, the idea of writing a book, of, of writing something that gets stuck in a moment in time that, that can't really be upgraded, that's not, that can't be updated, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of like, I, I find the freedom that comes with this this medium of podcast is actually a much better okay. one for what we're so trying to do. So more podcasts to come. I think so, yeah, because I honestly, I also feel like our strength, my strength, Stephen's strength, is really small things, not big things. Mm. And, and our books were a series of small things put together, whereas many books are one big thing. Gotcha. And so when I have something I'm really excited about, whether it's the ankle bracelets or whether it's an idea to save the rainforest, the Amazon rainforest. I, I feel like it's a it's a a better venue is is to try to go through the podcast these days for us. All right, we could talk a lot more. Is it all right if I come back to your office and just watch your work, <laughs> and then we'll go to the track and uh, yeah. all those gone and drink together? <laughs> Let's do it. All right, it was great having you here. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you guys. <laughs> Big Brains is a production of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. We're sponsored by the Graham School. Are you a lifelong learner with an insatiable curiosity? Access more than 50 open enrollment courses every quarter. 
Learn more at graham.uchicago.edu slash bigbrains. If you like what you heard on our podcast, please leave us a rating and review. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by Leah Cesarine and me, Matt Hodap. Thanks for listening. <laughs>